Good afternoon. I, I hope everybody is enjoying lunch. Uh, my name is Jay Krings. I'm a Vice President of Engineering at Target. I have the pleasure to support the teams that, that lead uh, Target.com and our flagship mobile app. Um, I was talking to a few folks this morning. I've been coming to this conference for almost two decades now. Uh, and it, it's such a pleasure for Target to be able to support and sponsor Mintech. Uh, I also get the, the privilege of serving on Mintech's board of directors, uh, which I've done for the last uh, four or five years now. Um, and this is always one of the highlights for me, especially in spring after a long winter, <laughs> to come back and reconnect with old colleagues. Uh, and, and even more importantly, being able to learn from each other. And, and that's one of the reasons why Target is so happy to support uh, MinTech and of course the Tech Connect Conference. Uh, speaking of learning, we have the privilege today to learn from one of the best, uh, from one of our very esteemed Minnesota companies, 3M. So it's my honor to introduce Dr. Jayshree Saith. Jayshree is a corporate scientist and chief science advocate at 3M. She joined 3M 30 years ago after receiving her master's and PhD in chemical engineering from Clarkson University in New York. She is an internationally recognized scientist and engineer with over 77 patents to her name, covering a variety of innovations. She's also the author of two books, one of which is in the back corner today yeah, it, that is free for you to grab on your way out. And she's also been featured in the documentary, Not the Science Type, which premiered at the 2021 Tribe Tribeca Film Festival. Jaysery is a sought after speaker on a multitude of topics, such as innovation, leadership, and one that is personally important to me, STEM, STEM advocacy. And we're very fortunate to learn from her today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jaysery Saith. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jake, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am uh, super excited to be here. Everybody says that, but I'll tell you what my excitement is about. I actually have a lapel mic. You know, I was at a meeting, kid you not, they gave me a handheld, and I was like, any hand talkers in the audience? You know exactly what I mean. Zoom doesn't cut it for us, it literally cut us off. That was our experience during the pandemic. It's very interesting how much we learned about ourselves, about each other, and about the world around us. And I know nobody wants to talk about the pandemic. It's, it's done, it's gone, and let's move on. But I think that's the key message of this conference, the key theme, in my view, is during that time, there was a lot of churn, there was a lot of change, and there was a lot of challenges. And that is exactly why we need to remember that, because that is where the opportunity lies. That is where the opportunity lies. Because if you zoom in now, you feel like so much has changed. But because of this experience that we have lived through, if we zoom out, we realize so much more needs to change. And it is only because of this particular time in our life that happened. You know, virtually all of humanity, we all faced the same existential crisis. We confronted the same fears. And most of us awaited for our turn of the gift of science and the vaccine. And science. Science was on the public discourse for the first time. And, and scientists were center stage in the evolving story of the pandemic. And what we learned based on what happened during that time also holds the key on how we empower our collective future. So that is why also I'm excited to be here and thanks to Jeff and Minnesota Technology Association for giving the opportunity to talk about some of the work we're doing at 3M to understand the public perception of science and also explain why we believe all of us, all of us in this room need to be advocates for STEM. So before I um, go there, most of you who have heard me talk before know that I like to start with this question. Where do I point? I, I, I did. One more time. There we go. So technology works most of the time. Um, what do you think? Did the public perception of science change during the pandemic? OK, I'm hearing heads. OK, tougher question now, now that you've eaten. Was it more positive or more negative? 
Did I hear negative? Enlightening, I like that answer. You know, the thing is, it's a tough question, right? You can argue with yourself. We found out that science was having its moment during the pandemic. There was no doubt in our mind that science would eventually vanquish the pandemic, but during this strange time that we lived through, we also saw that science and scientists and professionals in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, have a profound impact in shaping the future. And for the first time, it seemed as if the public recognized that. And because the public recognized that, the public now has expectations. So I'll explain what is going on. Sorry. Oh, there. Uh, so what happened essentially is science skepticism declined for the first time during the pandemic. Before the pandemic, the skepticism was rising, but during the pandemic, it went down. And trust in science and scientists, this is not working. I have animation now. Yeah, OK. So how are we going to do this? I'm going to pretend I'm doing this, and you'll click it. OK. Shh. So trust in science and scientists was the highest it had been. So this is very interesting to see, isn't it? Because most of us thought maybe it's pandemic. It's because sometimes you hear of and from only a very vocal minority. What we saw is that science was really having its moment. And so you probably are now wondering, wait a minute, why is 3M trying to understand the public perception of science? So let me back up and explain to you what we're doing and why. So at 3M, we care about science. It's the foundational strength behind our brand. It is what connects our businesses together. It fuels our innovation. And our purpose is to unlock the power of people, ideas, and science to reimagine what's possible. Science is also central to our sustainability framework at 3M. So we have science for climate, science for circular, and science for community. And in this pillar, we have been very active on STEM encouragement and education and equity for many, many, many years. Uh, last year, as an example, we spent $43 million in products and donations for STEM education initiatives. In 2020, our CEO announced a $50 million social justice fund, and a big part of that also is STEM equity. Actually, at this point, I'd like to just say the reason why STEM equity is important is because it is a very huge part of STEM advocacy. After being in this business of advocating, I have realized that if you're not an advocate for STEM equity, you really cannot be an advocate for STEM virtually. This is how intricately tied they are. And there are many reasons for that, and I'll talk about them. But I want to make sure that nobody tunes out thinking this is another one of those diversity, equity, whatever, whatever presentations. I know I've heard people say that, and that's why I want to be very clear. Here, the reason is we need to do this because there are many, many good reasons for it. One that I really like to talk about is we're going to be about 10 billion people on this planet. We have all sorts of sustainability challenges ahead of us. Not just sustainability challenges, a lot of challenges. And in order to solve them, very simply, all of us can't look the same, can't feel the same, can't think the same. All of us can't be from the same community, the same college, the same company, or the same country for that matter. That is the reason why it is important to advocate for STEM equity. Because without that, we are not going to be solving the problems that we're going to face. And there are many problems, including unlocking the keys to a sustainable future. We need every possible creative and diverse thought we can muster in order to solve these problems. And if you haven't seen this on our teams, I really encourage you to look at your teams again. Because in every team that I have been, I have been blown away by the perspective people bring in order to generate innovative ideas. And let me tell you, that's what the world needs. So it is extremely critical to think about STEM equity just in the same breath as you think about STEM advocacy. So we wanted to understand the perception of science, the global perception of science, because we care about science. We want to know what the public thinks about science. And there weren't any recent uh, surveys that were available that were global in nature, because like many of you, our company is extremely global. And so we actually commissioned our own survey. 14 countries, 1,000 respondents per country. And you can see that the countries are a mix of, of developed and developing. 
so who wants to know what we found out in late 2017 when we first did the survey on the global public perception of science? You're sitting here, you're gonna have to hear it, so. <laughs> All right, everybody wants to know. Well, here we go. Four out of 10 surveyed said, if science didn't exist, their lives would be no different. 32% of the people call themselves science skeptics, and in this population, six out of 10 said, if science did not exist, their lives would not be any different. And don't think that you're all technology people, so it's fine. Science to people is science, technology, engineering, and math. Really, that's what it is. All right, everybody's jaw is on the floor. What were they taking their survey on? <laughs> their laptops and mobile phones. Science is invisible, science is underappreciated, science is taken for granted. That's the problem. People don't realize that their planes, cars, trains, automobiles, the phones, the devices they can't live without, these are all applications of science, decades of scientific research in most cases, and that is a problem. What else did people say back then? People said, I was excited about science when I was a child. As an adult, there's no need for me to understand science. Others said, I'm not a genius. Only genius can have a career in science. Who do you think a statement like that deters the most? Exactly those who are underrepresented. In fact, we saw that women trail men in the positive sentiment of science. When asked, can you have a satisfying career in engineering, 25% of the men said yes. For women, it was only 9%. And so I stand in front of you here, an engineer by training, with a very satisfying career. We clearly have a lot of work to do. Now this was the most interesting part to me. People said, oh yeah, we want kids to know more about science, and I would encourage kids to take a career in science. Now, all of those who are parents probably understand this, that you can't say, well, I don't care about science, it's not for me, but you kids, you go do that. It doesn't work that way. I've tried it for other things, but it doesn't. Kids are watching. So if you don't have a positive public perception of science, kids aren't going to follow that. But this was something that was very hopeful to us. Because at the core of it, people do understand that science is important. It's needed. And in fact, they even want the next generation to be much more active in it. So there's obviously something there. So when these results became available, we had this discussion. Is this something that we could keep? within ourselves or is this something that really needs to be shared because we don't have all the answers. This is quite some data set. And so we decided that it was time to share these results and foster a global conversation with the entire STEM community. And I got the call to be the chief science advocate. And I was like, wait a minute, what is this now? We're doing what? Because this role, you know, you can quickly Google anything these days, chief science advocate, zero. There's nobody out there with that title. So why am I going to do this? Why are we doing this? The other thing they told me was, um, yeah, you're going to have to advocate for science. And I'm like, wait a minute now. I need to tell them four things. I never thought of myself as a science type when I was growing up. I was just literally pushed by my parents to go into this field. I never made it to any top colleges. I literally have no scientific expertise anymore, and I came into 3M through the back door as a summer intern. 3M didn't go look to hire me. So I'm gonna have to let them know all of this because they're coming to me for this role. And then I was like, well, how did you define science? This is impossible. Where did you go? How did you pick these people? You know, you try to go all analytical on it, and slowly enough you realize people are just reacting to whatever their perception is. And people's perception is their reality. It has taken us the entire pandemic to totally understand this. But yes, people are just reacting to what they are thinking about. And then it all started coming together to me. My own journey in STEM, and then also my experiences raising my kids, a son and a daughter. And I started thinking about this, and I thought, you know what, there's something to this advocacy piece. And there's something going on here which we need to understand. So I looked at our survey data, I looked at all these other surveys that had been done over the years, and I also looked into social science research about us as human beings and how we formulate our thoughts. And that helped me formulate what I call the ABCs of my advocacy strategy, quite literally. So the A of advocacy to me is about raising awareness and appreciation and acknowledgement of the issue and moving people from this apathy that they seem to feel 
B is about breaking down biases and boundaries and barriers and beliefs, you know, things like, I'm not a genius, I can't do science, or I'm a girl, science is not for me. And I'll tell you, despite having two PhD scientists at home, my daughter said, mommy, I don't wanna do science, that's for geeks. So that image of socially awkward, loner, maverick, evil, diabolical scientist, that's not gonna inspire little girls, or little boys for that matter. And C is for communication, communication, communication. Communication with a context that people can see and relate to. It is extremely critical. And this is exactly where some of the issues happened in the last few years. Uh, and I should also point out, that's me. That's the science of makeup and lighting. I was, <laughs> I'm telling you, I was pretty excited about that science. And my daughter said, it's a good picture. And I was just about to be happy when she said, but mommy, it doesn't look like you. And I was like, what do you mean? It has my name on it. I'm even on a cover of a magazine, and it's right there. And she said, it's a tween magazine, mommy. So anybody who has teenage daughters knows exactly how I feel and my pain. And so finally, this is the picture that they accepted of me, which is uh, enough science for them. <laughs> so I tell them that that's the picture I'm using, but I hide the others behind to show you the potential. But they were freaked out when they found out that I'm going to have to communicate. And they were like, no, 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 no. You can't be active on social media. You're going to embarrass yourself. And you know what they were worried about, that I was going to embarrass them. So there's this whole thing going on. So what did we do once the results became available? I'm just going to show you some smattering of things that we did. First is a scientist as storyteller's guide, because the data clearly showed us people said things like, we don't understand when scientists communicate. We want scientists to communicate in ways that we can understand. We want to understand the practical implications of what they're saying. This is all pre-pandemic, by the way, which was very interesting because you saw how things played out. And in that, actually, since most of you might recognize uh, some of the, Al uh, you know, Alan Alda and Katie Couric, and we used a lot of people who are good communicators to actually give us tips in that, in that guide, and it's free and downloadable. We also did podcast series where we took the data from the survey each year and talked to scientists and innovators and leaders and inventors to try and understand why the public is reacting or responding the way they are, and that was called Science Champions. We did a series called Beyond the Beaker, and in this one, we took scientists and portrayed them as everyday people, and the reason we had to do that was the data that was revealed and said, oh, STEM professionals, I don't know about them. Uh, they're like uh, only worried about this, only worried about that. It's like, no, they're everyday people. And that's why we showed people doing their, uh, you know, uh, things that they do outside of work, you know, taking care of kids, just to show same hopes, dreams, desires, et cetera. Because another one of the data points was like, the most STEM professionals are elitist. So that's another thing that creates a, a, a barrier in communication. And then finally, in 2020, when we were all locked down, and my colleagues were working hard to double the production of N95 respirators and double it again. What would we do, people who are not in that particular business unit and can't really help? So we created a science at home video series because remember at that point, 55 million kids in US alone were at home and that's one of those subjects that you really need some of those hand-on things. So we created this DIY video series and uh, it was a lot of fun. I got the baking soda and vinegar experiment I had never done it before in my life, and my kids were both like, you're, are you sure you're a scientist? I'm like, no, we never did this. So it was a lot of fun, and we had just one balloon, and nobody had to go, wanted to go out because it was the pandemic, so that one balloon had to work. It was so stressful, more stressful than my everyday experiments, but summer's around the corner. Check it out, 3M.com, science at home, and we have even Miss America who did one of the experiments because Miss America was a scientist in 2020, so. And then I write a lot. I write about topics such as um, keeping science and STEM in focus for people. So making sure it is very relatable, making sure that it is portrayed as a human endeavor that it is. We get so tied up into our subject that we don't even take a step back to understand that whatever we're doing is a very human endeavor. And in order to keep that in front of us, because there's a whole bunch of people who are going to judge what you are doing and why you're doing it. And then I also talk a lot about making sure we keep exposure and encouragement in that STEM and the limelight. And on that same topic, I also 
talk about the underrepresentation of women in STEM fields. And I call it like, you know, we got to do some steam cleaning. We have to shatter the stereotypes. There are a lot of stereotypes. And we have to make sure those are shattered. We have to tell the whole some story about science. You know, it's not just about the content, but also about the context, which is so important. And that is very important in attracting exactly those that we are underrepresented in, in STEM community. Then I talk about exposure and environment. It is very critical. If there was one thing that forced me to go into STEM was exactly that, was exposure and environment. And then you have to have men be allies and advocates. This is not a zero sum game. Everybody will benefit from it. So men really have to step up and be allies here. This is critical. And then metrics and measures, because sometimes people have all the right intentions, but numbers don't move, especially in organizations like yours and mine. And so you have to make sure that in large organizations and corporations, we have numbers and metrics and measures because those are needed. Otherwise, well, it'll all happen, it'll happen. It'll happen in a bazillion years, and that's not what we need. We need it now. And that's why metrics and measures are important. And I have to say, yesterday I pulled some uh, data from the uh, women in tech, and I wasn't sure which one to leave out. It was all so mind-boggling to me that women are not only severely underrepresented, numbers are not looking good for the future. In fact, many of the numbers are going down. And so I don't want you to focus on the numbers because I've been trained now to understand as a chief science advocate, don't rattle off numbers, but I still want you to see the numbers. The things to remember are, are, is, is four things. One is positive culture. There is something about the culture that is not allowing women to prosper in these areas. They're not allowing women to be attracted to these fields. And each one of us is responsible for culture. Culture is the conversations we're having. Culture is not something that the CEO says, boom, now we have culture. It's not. So each one of us needs to feel responsible for that positive culture and understand why is it that people are leaving this field and people are not joining the field. That's one. Second is pay parity. It's inexcusable. So go back to your own organizations and make sure that that is part of the metrics and measures. We have it at 3M, and we have achieved 100% pay parity. And it is important to have that. Third, what are the promotion and, and hiring schemes? How much bias, how much bias is folded into that? That is not allowing your teams to be successful because you don't have the diversity you need. You don't have the creativity you need. And so that is also, each one can ask questions. This is not something that only the CEO, CEO or the CHRO or whoever is responsible for. Each one of us is responsible for it. And the fourth is the pipeline. If all of us just sit in our offices and say people will come, it's not going to happen. That is why you have to go deeper into the ecosystem and into the pipeline. And that's what we have done forever at 3M. You got to go into the pipeline and see how you can make sure there's more women and underrepresented minorities coming into the field. You can't just sit there and expect them to come. So those four things, I think, are critical. And they are critical for this reason. What happened during the pandemic? People saw, oh, these fields are extremely important. These people have so much power. These people are shaping how we think, what we have to do, what we can't do. This is a powerful field, and there are lots of good jobs. Yes, we should have more people in science. We should have more people in all these fields. That's what people started saying. So now that there's an expectation that there's gonna be more people in the field, people are expecting to see society reflected in the community of STEM. And if they don't see that, we're setting ourselves up for failure. Here's another example from 2020 survey. People said, yes, we're very worried about coronavirus, and yes, we're very worried about health. But then what's the next issue? In 2020, the issue that people highlighted in science was STEM equity and social justice. It even edged out climate because of the year that it was. We all remember 2020 in Minnesota. So there's lots of issues here. In fact, there are people who say they have been discouraged from pursuing STEM. And this is the global data. And this shows that there are many barriers. And I want you to see the third barrier from top. Globally, the average is 27%. Among people who were discouraged from pursuing STEM fields, people said it's because of my gender, my race, or my ethnicity. And the global average is 27%, and the US average 
is 50%. So one out of two said, I was discouraged because of those reasons. So you know we have our work cut out here. We have our work cut out. Not only do we have our work cut out, pandemic and 2020 has given STEM fields a real lifeline of support. And that's why it's critical. That is the opportunity we are seeing because of the data revealed, these four critical relationships. And it's time to double down on, on, on STEM skepticism. First relationship, I call it science for health, of health for the health of science. Very interesting when our own health is involved, suddenly the public was much more interested in science because our own health makes science personal. It gives us a way to attract people to science more generally. And people also saw in a strange way the scientific process laid out that when more data becomes available, scientists do change their mind. And aren't we glad that they do because this is a process that relies on data and debate and discourse and discussion and isn't it great that it does? And having the public trained in the scientific process is critical because otherwise what happens? It gets politicized. Oh, look, they changed their mind. Well, damn straight we changed our minds because the data is different now, right? So we have to make sure that we keep that process going, which the pandemic gave us an opportunity to do. Second is the technology and sociology of trust. After everything that happened, people still view science and science-based corporation at the highest levels of trust. This is a great opportunity for all of us to be visible, accessible, and active in bolstering that public trust the foundation of public trust in science, because we all know what is happening now. We live in a society where trust is eroding. And there are trust in systems that cannot erode because it'll lead to God knows what. We are not prepared for that. So we have to make sure that we are active in our advocacy. Engineering of sustainable solutions. This was very interesting. How many of you remember the images of dolphins in the Venice Canal when humans were taking a pause, nature was thriving, there were animals in places we had never seen. The Himalayas were visible from my town, which 30 years nobody had seen that, oh my gosh, that's the Himalayas right there, you know, because the pollution cleared up. So for the first time, people saw a connection between human beings, science, and environment. And so they linked up science to solving health challenges. You can solve sustainability challenges. This is exactly what we need. This is exactly what we need. It's a great win-win for all of us because there are people who want to solve these problems and we know these problems need to be solved. So come on in, join the club. And then finally, math of equality and accountability. People said, yes, we hold government responsible, but it is very clear that it also is a role of corporation and NGOs and academias and down to the individual in order to make a difference in the world that we live in. So this was great to see. Now the idea of relating science to a very societal context and giving it a very human perspective is something that really relates to me. I already told you I didn't think I was the science and engineering type. Well, I grew up on the campus of an engineering institution in Northern India. It is one of the oldest engineering colleges in all of Asia. And my dad was a professor there. He himself has a PhD in, and he got it in England. So that's where I was as a, as a young kid. And I was not one of those who tinkered with toys and, and toyed with tools. I was curious more about people, less about things. And I really did not think of myself as, as the science type. But growing up in that environment, in that house, that's what both of us ended up doing, my brother and I. We became engineers. And I came to the US for graduate school, and then I ended up at 3M after a summer internship. And it has been the perfect place for me because it has a culture of empowerment, because there is an emphasis on collaboration, and above all, it is the communal context of improving lives. That's all I needed in order to be successful. And for somebody who didn't think growing up that they were the science type, I am at the highest level you can attain as a scientist at 3M. I have 77 patents to my name. I have been inducted into the 3M Science and Innovation Hall of Fame. And I got the highest achievement award by the Society of Women Engineers. And And I honestly, I'm dragging you through my story not to brag, but I want you to think about what I think about each and every day now. How many students 
how many scientists, how many ideas, and how many innovations are we all missing out on because of the way we teach, train, typify, and even talk about STEM. That is why we need to advocate for change. I would have never gone into this field because I would have never known the ability you have to work with people and to change lives. We never talk about that. And that is why we need to advocate for that. And I can give you my spiel, the real shtick in my mind, is STEM. <laughs> Science, humanities, technology, engineering, and math. You can have all the drive to the answers, but humanities is what will make you think about the right questions to ask. And in this day that we live in, with all the chatting we're doing on GPT, we all have to think about our prompt engineering. What are the right questions to ask? Because that thing will give you answers, right? Humanities are so critical. You can analyze all you want, but humanities will help you synthesize. It'll give you the kind of critical thinking mindset that we really, really need. So that is what I really believe in. And we saw that in spades when we uh, did the survey in 2021. 2021, if you remember, vaccines, countries opening up, world is opening up, and the very human sentiment of hope is what people linked with science. Science gives me hope. Hope for the next generation, hope for the future, and things like that. And in 2022, skepticism is already on an uptick, already on an uptick, because people have expectations of science. Trust still remains high, so we're very interested in next Two weeks, I think. Yeah, two weeks, we're going to release the results of 2023. And I'm waiting with bated breath. I actually know the results. But you, shh, you don't know it. And we'll see what happens. But this is something to keep in mind. This is actual public perception. And we have gone to 17 countries, and we'll have the 2023 results. And overwhelmingly, we, people, we hear people saying, I want the science community, I want the technology community, I want the engineering community, I want the math community to reflect what society looks like. Because for the first time, people have recognized it doesn't. Here's another example. Look at the overwhelming numbers here. And this is global, 17 countries. 90% say, yeah, we need more people pursuing STEM careers. 88% say it is important to increase diversity and inclusion in STEM. And 87% said we need to do more to engage more women and girls in science. So we get all these girls excited about science, right? And they enter the workforce, and then they go, oops, this is not a place where I belong. And so it is the responsibility of all of us. Same thing for any, any historically marginalized community. It's exactly the same thing. And that's why it's responsibility for all of us. Seven out of 10 said there are negative consequences if we fail to attract enough women and girls in science. And it's not all up to the women and girls. There's a lot of responsibility that we all have who are in the profession right now. So one thing we did at 3M was we created this docu-series uh, that uh, you mentioned, Jake mentioned. It's called Not the Science Type. And we want to show that you can blaze trails you can pursue your passions. You can shape your careers. You can bring in your interests like I did, my interest in humanities and social sciences that I brought into my STEM uh, journey. And science needs you to be you. Your paths can be diverse, just as diverse as we all are. And I was honored to be one of the scientists featured in it. It really brought my purpose to life in ways I could have never imagined. We wanted to inform, influence, and inspire the next generation. And so please check it out. It's called Not the Science Type, and it's available. And please show it to others. And I, I really, truly think that it, it shows what the world needs right now, and uh, very, very inspiring. Here's another data point from 2022. We asked the people who were in STEM, why did you pursue STEM? And you see that underrepresented professionals especially look at social impact and making a difference. That is the kind of diversity we need. It's not good or bad. It's not right or wrong. It is the inroad you make into a particular field and why you do it. So if we keep telling people that you are going to have a great career 
and you should be very passionate about this field, a lot of people like me will never join the field because you know what I want to do? I want to change the world. And if you don't talk about that, the fact that you can have an impact in the world if you follow this field, you are still losing out on all of those people. And the reason why I show that is it's not a day go goes by when we are working on some innovation that we realize that we need outside thinking, we need different thinking. It isn't necessarily about how people look or where they're from and how they speak. There's a lot of difference in way people think, their experience sets and things like that. That's the diversity we need in order to solve these problems. And that is why there is a lot of emphasis on this area right now, to see how we can get more people engaged who have been historically marginalized or excluded from this. And the reason is very simple, because environments that lack diversity are like closed communities. They're like echo chambers, where the same voices will continue to reflect and reverberate. What is the problem with that? The problem is their viewpoint doesn't shift, so problems are identified with a very narrow point of view. And what that does is that makes science itself vulnerable when problems are not defined with a societal perspective in a humanities context. So what can we do? That is the reason why 3M is active, and I'm assuming all your companies are, and if they are not, go back and make sure they are, is to dig deep into the pipeline, because that's where it'll need to start. We all need a healthy pipeline of diverse professionals. And how do we do that? So you have to take care of what I call the ecosystem, you know, all the way from exposure, encouragement, economics, equity, engagement, empowerment, all of those areas we have to pay attention to. Because if we don't do it, it's almost, it's, it's, it's a must do. It's, it's not a nice to do. Because we all saw what happened during the pandemic. Science can get rejected. Technology will not be trusted. Products, obsoleted. Companies, obliterated. It's no longer just about the practice of science. People are asking, who are the practitioners? It's no longer just the policies. The politics is all wrapped into it. And it's no longer about people. They'll just do what we tell them to. It's not a monolithic community anymore. And it, re it, it really leads to action or inaction, as we saw. And that is why it is a must do. We absolutely need to do this. The world requires innovation. Innovation needs science. Science demands diversity, and diversity warrants equity. That's the truth. So people ask, what can we do as individuals? A lot. We, of course, need science and need more people in science and need more people who can talk about science, but we also need those who are supporting science, enthusiastic about science. We need people who can communicate the social benefits of science. So I tell people there are a lot of things you can do in your community and at home to inspire the next generation. Just plant the seeds of STEM and watch them grow into well-informed, critical thinking problem solvers. That's all the world needs. So things like volunteering at events, organizing events in the community, inspiring people, championing to bring toys and tools. Minnesota's ranking in a lot of these things is not super good. And this is the community that can really drive change, and I know you're doing it, but that's exactly what, it is, what is needed. I shudder to think of year after year as people look at our school systems and, and look at different states and where we are in that, and we have no right to be there, no reason to be there. And so a lot we can all do individually. And finally, engaging, just engaging with people and solving problems together. And that just shows a learning attitude, and that goes a long way as well. So there are a lot of things you can do to give your voice to, give your voice to STEM. And I want to close exactly where I started, 2020. So for all of us in Minnesota, it was a very rough year because it was just hard to accept what had gone on in our own state. And what it really made me do is question where I stand in all of this. I'm not black, I'm not white, but I'm a very highly privileged, highly educated South Asian immigrant. What is my role in it? And I slowly realized that it is shame on me that I don't know how systemic the issue has been. And so I read as much as I could possibly do, but I didn't feel better about myself. And then I realized I need to use my talent to do something. So I collected all the essays that I've written over the years 
and we published it in a book, and it was published by uh, Society of Women Engineers, and all proceeds go to a scholarship for black, Latinx, or Hispanic women in STEM. And I'm, oh. oh. And I was really honored to actually meet the first scholar. And you won't believe what happened. I was invited to speak at Georgia Tech. There's a Silas Ethics lecture there. And it was in person. And it was my first speech after the vaccines were uh, developed and we all were able to go out. And it just happens to be the college where the first scholar is going. You can't make this stuff up. And here I was. I actually got to meet her. Of course, she's still probably wondering, who's this middle-aged lady crying, you know? <laughs> because it was so emotional for me. Just think about it. We always say, oh, one person can't make a difference. One person can make a difference because other people join. That's what happens. So I was on my flight back, and I called my husband, and I said, I know what I'm going to do. And he's like, uh-oh. I'm going to write another book because I can't stop here. I mean, just imagine. I just imagined. So I took all the learnings that I had during this period of really deep reflections and tough transitions and the meaningful actions that can come from that. And the second book was published in 2021. And all proceeds of this also go to the same scholarship. And I have to tell you that the second student has started uh, from the proceeds of that. And I'm very thankful to Jeff and the team here that they have actually purchased the books uh, and they are in the back. And I brought my best pen and I'm happy to sign for anybody who wants to have a signature in there. And here's what you can do, because there's no free lunch, is buy the first book, because we're giving you the, first, uh, uh, the second book, but buy the first book and, and give it to someone, read it, share it, because at the end of the day, even if you get one thing out of it, remember what you give back is even more important, which is the gift of education. So it's a win-win. That's the best gift you can ever give. So with that, I join my hands to you.